Europe, 1796. During four years of unremitting struggle, revolutionary France has fought off the great powers of Europe, who fear that France's liberal ideals will spread to their empires. Desperate for military success, the Directory of France, which is neither competent nor popular, has decided to go on the offensive against Austria, the greatest threat to the French Republic. Three armies are to converge and then advance on Vienna to end the war. But the corrupt Directory neglects to supply its armies, and the commanders seldom cooperate, leaving the offensive doomed to failure. That is, until a brilliant young general arrives to take command of the southernmost army, the Army of Italy. Twenty-six years old and untested in command. His name is Napoleon Bonaparte, and he will change everything. A lack of government support, unpredictable payments to soldiers, and appalling conditions have reduced the French Army of Italy from over 100,000 soldiers down to 38,000 fighting men. The army has been forced back to the frigid Alps and parts of the northern Italian coastline, which are continuously harassed by the British Navy. In spite of possessing some talented generals forged by the revolution, the French army of Italy has stagnated. Any hope of glory has long since left the rank and file, while the continued losses and a neglectful government threatens to collapse what remains of the army of Italy. Meanwhile, the coalition has been enjoying relative success in Italy. Despite historical grievances, the revolution has united both Piedmont and Austria in an uneasy alliance against France. The rich plains of central Italy keep the 30,000 Austrian and 25,000 Piedmontese soldiers well supplied on the French frontier. Their commanders are experienced, though many are elderly and used to an older, more measured type of warfare. Nevertheless, they are confident in plans to push the French out of Italy once and for all. In late March, Bonaparte arrives to take command of the Army of Italy. But he is initially met with resentment by the leading generals. General Bonaparte is much younger, far less accomplished, and lacks experience in command. His appointment is seen as a result of his political connections, frustrating the leading generals, who have earned their rank through hard work and perseverance. It doesn't take long for Bonaparte to assert his control. After an initial inspection, the disorderly troops are quickly reorganized and prepared for deployment. Provisions are gathered from all over southern France and management over the unreliable supply system is immediately improved. Most importantly, Bonaparte prepares a new, bold plan of attack, which he formulated in the prior two years while making a careful examination of the Italian theater. Months of inaction and poor planning are wiped away, replaced by the vision, inspiration, and leadership of their new commander. Bonaparte has brought new life to the army of Italy, but he will need to act fast and decisively in the campaign ahead, or fade into obscurity like the many who came before him. As winter gives way to spring in 1796, both France and Austria are amassing their forces in preparation for attack.
The main Austrian army, led by the 71-year-old General Beaulieu, is concentrating north of the key seaport of Genoa. Beaulieu believes the French are planning an attack on Genoa in order to disrupt coordination with the British Mediterranean Naval Squadron, vital to expel the French from northern Italy. His plan is to use the bulk of his forces to drive out the isolated French garrison at the port of Voltri and maintain control of the northern Italian coastline. But Beaulieu's obsession with an imagined French attack on Genoa leads him to send only 8,000 soldiers with Argento to defend the strategic mountain passes, the only viable connection linking the Austrian and Piedmontese armies. Beaulieu also commands Argento to drive the French from Montenote in hopes of diverting some of the main French army away from Genoa. The two conflicting objectives leave Argento with no option but to break apart his already small force, and he quickly becomes overextended. Fifty miles to the west, General Colley and his 25,000 Piedmontese are to remain dispersed among the many mountain passes, towns, and depots of Piedmont, ready to defend against an anticipated French direct assault. Beaulieu's decision to split up his forces and leave isolated garrisons across the countryside are actions common among generals of the era, but will prove calamitous in the campaign ahead, as Bonaparte introduces a new, fast-paced style of war. Bonaparte, knowing that he will be outnumbered if his opponents are able to combine forces, begins enacting his daring plan. Aware of the Austrian dispositions, he prepares to concentrate his reorganized and reinvigorated army near Savona so they can strike quickly. The army is to advance north to the strategic road junction at Dago, exploiting the gap between the Austrian and Piedmontese armies, which Argento struggles to defend. With superior numbers, Bonaparte will drive Argento's small forces towards the safety of the main Austrian army further east, before turning back to crush the scattered and now isolated Piedmontese. As dawn broke on the 10th of April, General Beaulieu's troops emerged from the mountain passes surrounding Voltri to assault the French garrison. Despite being heavily outnumbered, the French stubbornly hold until nightfall, whereupon they fall back to rejoin Massena's vanguard near Savona. General Beaulieu, pleased with his victory and believing he stopped the attack on Genoa, decides not to pursue the fleeing French. He now directs Vukasovic, an aggressive and experienced general, to take 3,500 men and support the overextended Argento. However, Voltri is far from Montenote, and this support will take time to arrive. To the west, Argento is following Beaulieu's orders to drive the French from Montenote. Although successful in capturing some of the forward French bastions, his effort to storm the main redoubt on Montenegino stalls with heavy losses. Beaulieu's early offensive and capture of Voltri catches Bonaparte by surprise. However, it also reveals that the main Austrian army is far from Bonaparte's line of attack. Reacting rapidly to this intelligence, Bonaparte orders General Augereau to take his main force and head to Melissimo. He then turns his attention to crushing Argento. Divisional Commander La Harpe is sent to reinforce the French defenders on Monte Neguino, while Bonaparte advances up the Bormida Valley with General Massena's vanguard to hit Argento's right flank. Marching through heavy mud and broken trails, Massena's vanguard emerges from thick fog and strikes the exposed Austrian flank while La Harpe launches a pinning attack from atop Monte Neguino to keep them in place. Argento's forces collapse, having been caught completely off guard. Argento himself leads the escape, as his remaining troops are being routed. Bonaparte, bolstered by his success, orders La Harpe to remain near the battlefield as rearguard. 
while he and Masena continue on to meet up with the main column. Late on the 12th of April, they unite with General Ogero at Karkare, but the difficult terrain has left much of Ogero's forces strung out on the road, and most have not yet arrived. Believing the Austrians sufficiently defeated, Bonaparte plans to concentrate his forces for an attack on Kali's dispersed Piedmontese army before they can unite, while Massena continues on to seize Dago. Ogero, leading the advance against Kali, encounters a small Piedmontese garrison, blocking the main path in the ruins of a castle at Cosaria. The garrison could present a threat to Bonaparte's advance if not dealt with, so he decides to send Ogero to storm it, rather than waste time bypassing it. Despite Ogero's significant numerical advantage, which is growing as his column begins arriving, the assault is beaten back by the well-fortified defenders, and nearly a thousand French are lost, before the castle finally surrenders the following day. The assault on Caseria proves to be a costly but valuable lesson for Bonaparte, who learns to avoid hasty attacks on fortified positions later in the campaign. As Caseria is resisting Ogero, Masena's advance on Dago likewise stalls. Masena is sobered by the Austrians' well-fortified position, and he believes that they have a significant force there. So he decides to wait for the remainder of his division to arrive before taking the village. Bonaparte is also informed that there is an Austrian buildup in Dago. So, he leaves the advance on Piedmont to Ogero in order to return to Dago to support Massena. In fact, it is defended only by the battered remains of Argento's force and a small Piedmontese garrison, which anxiously await the arrival of fresh soldiers from Vukasovic. At daybreak on the 14th, Bonaparte, having taken command from Massena, orders the assault to begin. Masena leads a column in a frontal assault on the village. As La Harpe outflanks the Austrians to the left, and General La Salette, advancing on the east bank of the Bormida, severs their only path of escape. Outnumbered two to one, and with their only line of retreat under threat, the already demoralized Austrians break and rapidly fall back towards Aqui. Bonaparte, believing he has once more sent the Austrians into a comprehensive withdrawal, turns his attention back to shattering the Piedmontese, taking Massena and some of his division with him. The remaining soldiers from Massena's division are left to occupy the region surrounding Dago and to forage for supplies. As Argento's scattered forces flee, Vukasovic finally arrives before dawn the next morning with 3,500 reinforcements. Vukasovic's Austrians catch the remaining French troops at Dago by surprise in the early morning hours, tearing through the scattered and weakened French division. The French flee southwards, abandoning the artillery they had captured the previous day. Once again, Bonaparte turns back to Dago entrusting Ogero and General Surrier with his advance on Piedmont. Bonaparte redirects Massena's and La Harpe's divisions to return with him to Dago. On his return, Massena also gathers his fleeing troops from Dago to rejoin for the attack. French counterattacks begin in piecemeal, as Massena arrives first and is later joined by La Harpe. Fighting sweeps back and forth across the village, but Vukasovic's resolute defense holds late into the afternoon, inflicting heavy losses on the French. Vukasovic had hoped to receive reinforcements from Argento's division once they realized his success in Dago, but Argento's troops are still shaken by their defeat and are in no condition to support Vukasovic. The French numerical superiority begins to show 
outnumbered more than four to one. Vukasovic clings on desperately, but cannot stop the French from breaking through and swarming the town. Vukasovic has no option but to retreat and rejoin the main army, concentrating at Acqui. Although the Austrian losses were more than double those of the French, the continuous retaking of Dago has cost Bonaparte precious time and compels him to leave behind many additional men to keep watch on the Austrian army. As Bonaparte launches his offensive against the Austrians, General Colley is working tirelessly to concentrate his Piedmontese army. By the morning of the 14th, he has amassed the bulk of his army at Montezamolo, but concerned by French General Surrier's advance from the south, and by news of the initial Austrian defeat at Dago, he decides to pull back to Cheva. Augereau pursues Colley, but after a poorly organized and half-hearted assault, is halted in front of the intimidating Piedmontese defenses. April 16th is a day of rest, reconnaissance, and repositioning for Bonaparte. The following morning, having received confirmation that the Austrians are indeed retreating towards Alessandria, Bonaparte renews his offensive against the Piedmontese. However, realizing that the entire French army is concentrating against him, and that the Austrians are moving further away, Colley decides to fall back with his main force to an even more imposing defensive position behind the Corsiglia River. He does leave a garrison in the fortress at Cheva, which stubbornly refuses to surrender when the French army arrives. Having learned his lesson at Caseria, Bonaparte simply bypasses the fortress, moving up towards Colley's new position. Bonaparte decides to dislodge Colley from the Corsiglia River with a two-pronged assault. Augereau will attack at the confluence of the Tenaro and Corsiglia rivers, while Surrier, advancing with two columns, will force his way through the village of San Michele. Massena, meanwhile, is to remain in reserve to support these operations. Early in the morning of the 19th, Surrier's division charges towards the San Michele Bridge, while Augereau tries to find another way across the swollen Tenaro River. But the Piedmontese have had time to prepare. Holding the high ground behind an impassable river, Colley's troops are formidable. Surrier's men, forced to rush the bridge, are decimated by Piedmontese cannon fire and are driven back for now. In late morning, a small group of Piedmontese pickets attempting to return to the main army are noticed and followed by French skirmishers, who observe them crossing an unguarded aqueduct. The French rush a demi-brigade across and launch a surprise attack from the south, while Surrier renews his attack from the east, successfully taking San Michele. Rather than pressing their advantage, the ill-supplied French elated by success, descend into undisciplined looting, giving the Piedmontese time to regroup. Just as with Dago, the French are once again caught unaware by a strong counterattack. Surrier's men, on the verge of victory, are forced into a disorderly retreat back across the river to their starting positions. Bonaparte's attack has failed. His men, hungry, tired, and stung by their recent defeat, are on the verge of mutiny. Few supplies can reach the army through the winding mountain passes. Time is Bonaparte's greatest enemy. He needs victory soon, or he will be forced to concede defeat. Colley has his own dilemma. If the French are able to break through or outflank his line, the Piedmontese army will collapse. Even though Beaulieu is turning back from Alessandria to help the Piedmontese, delays in communication leave General Colley believing that the Austrians are too far to provide support. Colley, weighing the strength of his position after the near disaster at San Michele, makes the fateful decision to abandon his defenses on the Corsiglia River in order to find a new defensive line near Mondovi. On the evening of the 20th, 
the Piedmontese light campfires to conceal their withdrawal. But Bonaparte, suspicious by the lack of activity, has sent scouts across the river who discover the evacuation. Despite the poor condition of his army, Bonaparte views this as his best opportunity to defeat the Piedmontese by catching them before they can establish a new defensive position. By 10 a.m. on the 21st, Surrier's lead brigade descends from the mountain passes around the surprised Piedmontese rearguard. Heavy fighting breaks out, but as the French bring up cannons and grow in numbers, the unprepared Piedmontese crumble, and their general, Dichot, is killed. The remaining soldiers of the rearguard fall back to the protection of the main army. Kali had planned to set up his defense along the river Alero. However, when he arrives, he is dismayed to find the area unsuitable. Difficult terrain and the lack of entrenchments on a position that can be easily outflanked forces Kali to continue on past Mondovi, but his uneasy troops are bottlenecked in the small town and movement is slow. The arrival of the fleeing Piedmontese rearguard and the death of the popular and brave General Dichot are enough to send the army into chaos. Order and discipline collapse as the soldiers hastily begin ransacking their own town before retreating, leaving behind valuable equipment and munitions. A triumphant Bonaparte marches into Mondovi that evening. His troops, reinvigorated by their easy victory, pause at Mondovi for much needed rest and resupply. With his army crumbling and his finances strained, King Victor Amadeus III of Piedmont Sardinia decides to open negotiations with the French in Genoa to bring an end to the war. General Colley, now with only 10,000 men scattered around Kerasco, requests an armistice with Bonaparte. Knowing that Colley's forces are broken and demoralized, Bonaparte refuses and instead demands harsh concessions while continuing the invasion into the heart of Piedmont. Generals Ogero and Massena begin a joint advance up the Tanaro River towards Carrasco, while Surrier captures Trinita. Believing his army too weak to hold back the French, Colley initiates yet another difficult retreat to Carmagnola, just 12 miles south of the capital. His exhausted army drags itself through relentless rain and bitter cold as they make their retreat. The tattered remains of the army finally begin gathering at Carmagnola, but the Piedmontese are in no condition to fight as the French continue their relentless advance. On the 25th of April, the French take Carrasco, and the following day, Bonaparte enters Alba, Meanwhile, La Harpe is pushing towards Aqui with his division, threatening to engage with Beaulieu's unsupported forces. Beaulieu, who has been preparing to assist Kali's ragged army, is furious to learn the Piedmontese attempts at negotiation with Bonaparte. The uneasy alliance between Austria and Piedmont falls apart as Beaulieu begins preparations for a retreat across the Po River ransacking his former allies' villages along the way. Without the support of the Austrians, and with his army now completely unable to resist the French onslaught, King Victor has no alternative but to capitulate to Bonaparte's demands. The Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia is forced to give up territory hand over control of strategic fortresses and bridges to the French, provide munitions and other supplies to Bonaparte's army, and allow unrestricted French movement across their territory. Napoleon Bonaparte, in the span of two short weeks, has delivered a much-needed military triumph to France. Hard work coupled with the promise of riches and glory, has transformed undisciplined, ill-equipped soldiers into a formidable force 
that inflicted nearly 12,000 casualties, almost twice its own losses, across six battles. His bold planning, innovative tactics, and speed of operations has led to the destruction of Piedmont's entire army and the abrupt retreat of the Austrians. The rapid success of this campaign provides an early glimpse of what will come. Bonaparte's military mastery will eventually propel him to become one of history's greatest conquerors.